you ever seen strange or different looking rock formations and wondered about them? Where they came from? And how they were formed? To explain these processes, you would have to go back in time. Back to a time after Earth was formed as a planet. To understand geological time, geologists and scientists have organized it into large segments called the Precambrian, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic eras. These eras are in turn subdivided into periods. For example, the Tertiary period, or Age of Mammals, was in the Cenozoic era an era about 60 million years ago to the present. By defining various eras and periods, scientists have been able to classify many features about the Earth and its formation. It seems people have always been curious about our planet, the Earth. What is inside it, beneath the cities, the forests, and the oceans? Many theories have been suggested, but it is not known for sure since no one has seen the inside of the Earth. Even the deepest mines are like scratches on the surface because the distance to the center of the Earth is about 6,400 kilometers or 4,000 miles. Scientists can, however, study depths far beyond those they can reach Using explosives to generate sound waves and very sensitive microphones and other equipment, they can trace the sound waves as they travel through the Earth. Since these waves travel at different speeds and different kinds of materials, scientists can form an image of the Earth's interior. By studying how shock waves travel through the Earth, scientists believe that the Earth has three layers, something like a hard-boiled egg. Like an eggshell, the Earth has a thin outside layer called the crust. The crust is the layer we know the most about since it is easiest to study. Below the crust is the mantle, and at the very center of the Earth is the core. Both are believed to be made up of nickel and iron. The core is believed to have two parts. The inner core is solid, and the outer core is liquid. The core is the hottest part of the Earth, where temperatures may be as high as several thousand degrees. The core is quite dense, or very tightly packed together, and it is thought to create the Earth's magnetism. The mantle is not as dense and hot as the core, but it is thought to be hotter closer to the core and cooler closer to the crust. The mantle is made up of a thick, rock-like material that is always flowing very slowly. Above the mantle is the crust, the outermost and thinnest layer. The crust may be as thick as 50 kilometers or 30 miles and as thin as 4 kilometers or 2 miles. It is thinnest beneath the oceans. For various reasons, the crust of the Earth is always changing. Some changes are sudden and other changes have occurred over millions of years. The crust is not locked in place but more or less floats on top of the mantle. This has caused some changes in the crust over the last 180 million years. Scientists believe that all continents were once one large landmass. They even named this supercontinent. It is called Pangaea because the materials that make up the continents float on the crust much like ice on water. This allows the continents to move slowly over thousands of years. These same scientists also believe that Pangaea broke up millions of years ago because of the pressures of that movement. Like an ice flow, these pieces each moved in different directions to become the continents we know today. In fact, the continents are still drifting, moving a few centimeters every 100 years. This idea was first proposed by a climatologist named Alfred Wegener back at the turn of the century. Most geographers laughed at the idea, considering it too ridiculous for words, but a discovery made in the 1960s confirmed everything Wegener had proposed. This discovery was a giant crack which runs the entire length of the Atlantic Ocean, from the north to almost Antarctica. Studies showed that material from the Earth's core was constantly welling up in this long crack, pushing up and making it wider. That in turn forced the continents on either side of the Atlantic further apart. 
Since that discovery, scientists have come up with another idea, the plate tectonic theory that helps to explain the movements of the Earth's crust. The plate tectonic theory suggests that the Earth's crust is actually made up of about 20 pieces called plates. These plates are floating on the mantle, which is flowing slowly, causing the plates to move. The movement of the plates causes movement of the oceans and continents. When two plates push together, changes happen. Sometimes one plate slides up on top of another, and sometimes the edges of the plates become crumpled. The movement of the plates may explain how earthquakes and volcanoes happen and how mountains are formed. An earthquake happens when there is a sudden movement of the Earth's crust. Most earthquakes occur along the edges of plates. It is thought that the plates are pushed together by the flow of the mantle. Great pressure builds up as they push against each other. Suddenly, the plates slip past one another, causing an earthquake. Shock waves from the earthquake move out through the crust in all directions. The earthquake is felt in places far from where the plate slippage actually occurred because of the shock waves. Often, the plate slippage happens underground where it cannot be seen, but sometimes it does happen at the surface. The cracks in the Earth's crust created by earthquakes are called faults. Volcanoes occur in many of the same areas that earthquakes occur near the edges of plates. The hot rock, called magma, that is underneath the Earth's crust is also under great pressure. When it pushes up against cracks in the Earth's crust, it may be able to force its way up to the surface where it spurts or flows out or creates intrusions of igneous rock formed from the cooling molten magma into previously existing rock. Some volcanoes erupt with a big explosion because a great deal of pressure is built up before the magma is let out. Other volcanoes allow the magma to flow out gradually so there is no sudden eruption. Many volcanoes erupt time after time, even though hundreds of years may pass between eruptions. Each time they erupt, they grow larger. The magma, called lava when it is above the crust, builds up layer after layer and eventually creates a mountain. Some volcanic mountains are formed of layers of cinder, ash, or pieces of rock blown out of the volcano. Another kind of mountain, called the dome mountain, is also created by magma pushing up against the crust. Dome mountains are different from volcanoes because in dome mountains the magma doesn't break through the crust. The magma pushes up against the crust so that it lifts up to make a dome shape but doesn't crack or split. The magma cools and hardens into that shape creating a dome mountain. A second kind of mountain is created along cracks or faults in the Earth's crust. They are called fault block mountains. A fault block mountain is formed when a large block of crust along a fault is pushed up and sometimes tilted. In the same way, valleys can be formed when a block of crust is pushed down. However, most mountains are created in places where the plates touch. They are called folded mountains. Often when plates push together, the edges crumple or fold. The more they push together, the bigger the folds become, eventually creating mountains. Sometimes the folds are pushed until they break, or sometimes one fold will be pushed up on top of another fold. You can see the fold patterns in some mountains. Besides changes made by volcanism, the Earth's crust is always being changed by wind, water, rain, and ice. Rainwater and wind wear down rock and soil, moving them from place to place and changing the appearance of the crust. During the Precambrian era, the rock base underlying Canada was formed. As upland areas were eroded and built up again, perhaps several times, rivers poured sediments into the lowland areas. 
As these troughs of sediments were sinking, shallow seas began to emerge and a steady flow of sedimentary materials poured into these areas. Sedimentation continued until the mass of sedimentary materials slowly changed to sedimentary rock as the weight increased. Sedimentary rock formations can be seen in many places in lowland areas, in folded and faulted mountain areas, and in valleys, gorges, and hills. Glaciers or ice caps that once covered large parts of North America about two million years ago advanced or retreated due to changing climates and other conditions. Glaciers are formed over many years in areas where more snow falls than melts. As the snow accumulates and becomes thicker, it is compressed and changes into dense, solid ice. As thick masses of slow-moving ice advance, the land is eroded as the glacier acquires boulders and rock fragments, which in turn gouge and erode the rock over which the glacier passes. As the glacier retreats, till deposits are left behind and may be in many forms. As meltwater streams flowing from the glacier carry drift deposits, the landscape is also changed. As the continental ice sheets advanced and retreated, it has left its influence on the face of the landscape in mountain erosion, valleys, river courses, and flat lowland. The landscapes of Canada can be divided into three main groups, lowlands, highlands, and the Canadian Shield. The Canadian Shield covers about half of Canada and forms its geographic foundation. Formed during the Precambrian era, some of this rock is over 350 million years old, among the oldest rock in the world. Two types of rock, igneous and metamorphic, make up most of the Canadian Shield. The area is called the Canadian Shield because it is shaped something like a warrior shield, roughly round and lower in the center. The lowland areas of Canada can be divided into three main regions, the Hudson Bay Arctic lowlands, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence lowlands, and the interior plains. The Hudson Bay Arctic lowlands are made up of flat swamp and forest around southwestern Hudson Bay and the low rolling islands of the Arctic. In these areas, the underlying rock is sedimentary rock, which may contain minerals. The Great Lakes St. Lawrence lowlands also have sedimentary rock beneath the surface. These lowlands have a rolling landscape that was created mainly by glaciation during the last ice age. The Great Lakes lie in a basin gouged out by glaciers and were once much larger than today. The St. Lawrence Valley is a flat area, which is actually a fault that has filled in through glacial flooding and soil deposits. The interior plains are part of the Great Plains of North America, which extend from the Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. There is sedimentary rock beneath the surface, which formed long ago when oceans covered the area. Potash, oil and gas are found in this underlying sedimentary rock. The interior plains have an overall downward slope from west to east and the landscape is flat or rounded and gently rolling. The highland areas of Canada can also be divided into three main regions, the Appalachians, the Inuitian Mountains and the Western Cordillera. The Appalachians are part of a mountain system that stretches from the southern United States up into the Maritimes and Newfoundland. The Appalachians are the oldest highland region in Canada, having formed about 200 million years ago during the Mesozoic era. They formed when the rock of the area was uplifted and folded to create mountains. The rock is mostly sedimentary, but in some places igneous or metamorphic rock is found. At first, the peaks of the Appalachians were jagged, but over time they have eroded. 
Today, the area is made up of rounded rolling hills and mountains and wide valleys. The Inuitian mountains found in the north are similar to the Appalachians, but younger. They are made up mostly of sedimentary rock with some igneous and metamorphic rock. They have not yet eroded, so are still high and jagged. Due to the harsh climate of the region, few plants grow on these mountains, and some peaks are permanently covered by ice and snow. The western Cordillera is made up of many ranges of mountains separated by plateaus and valleys. On the eastern side are the Rocky Mountains, a narrow band of folded and faulted sedimentary rock. The interior mountains and plateaus are made up of metamorphic and igneous rock, some of which is volcanic. This area is wider, but not as high as the Rocky Mountains. It contains some major rivers, such as the Columbia and the Fraser, as well as the Columbia Mountains. The coastal mountains are made up of igneous rock, mostly granite. They include some of Canada's highest mountains. During the last ice age, glaciers eroded the valleys, creating rugged fjords. Many tourists come from all over the world to see this beautiful region. It is important to remember that all this magnificent scenery is not forever. It has not always been here and will not continue forever. In terms of the life of the earth, mountains, rivers, oceans, and even continents constantly change. On occasion, we see these changes happen at a speed we can recognize. When an earthquake happens along the Pacific coast, that is caused by movement of continents and the plates supporting them. When a volcano explodes, that is an example of the molten materials from the interior of the earth finding their way through the crust and forming new land or adding to the existing land. But there are other forces as well, the forces of erosion. Running water washes materials from uplands to lowlands and reshapes the banks of rivers, creating wide flood plains and fertile farmlands. Soils washed from riverbanks by spring rains can be carried by the river to lakes or the ocean. There, the soils gradually form deltas, which over thousands of years become new land. Glaciers gouge deep valleys into mountains, as here in British Columbia, or bulldoze the soil from entire continents, as happened to the Canadian Shield. Even wind can shape the landscape. These hoodoos are created by the sandblasting effect of winds on soft rock. All of these forces have shaped and continue to shape Canada's landscape, sometimes quickly and sometimes so slowly no one ever notices. The results of that reshaping, however, continues to influence the land use today.